Welcome back, College Baseball Central fans. This is the weekend rotation. Join you every single Saturday morning of the season here. Getting you all ready for the rest of the weekend and telling you everything about Friday night. Man, it was it was it was a it was a weekend slate here. You know, this Friday night was all over the board with teams and it was, you know, a lot of baseball here. Today I'm joined by Jake McKeever. How are we doing, Jake? Uh, feeling good. Uh, back after kind of a, a 10-day hiatus. Um, just wanted to know bullying works. Uh, the Arkansas fans kind of got to me. Uh, so I'm take a little <laughs> break there, but but back in action to talk about Arkansas baseball this morning. <laughs> Noah, how are we doing this morning? Pretty good, Mark. Always a great, great, great to be here with you and your smiling face and the, the new hat you have on this weekend. Yeah, I'm wearing a, a new old hat, uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, loving the bows today. They went out and got a win last night, so big win for them, but we'll get into more baseball that probably more of the rest of the country watched versus the Hawaii Bows last night. Jake, I'm going to let you start with this one. Charlotte 0, ECU 11, throws another no-hitter for them. My goodness, this ECU team seems to get better every single week. I know that you've had a hard time with your ranking of them, but where do you see this ECU team being now 11-0 against Charlotte and another sh another no-hitter? Yeah, and, and I should say that Charlotte is one of the better teams of the AAC. That was kind of my main critique of ECU is that they're playing so many of these bad teams that they really have to go out and dominate. And I, I guess I read the tweets because they go out, dominate, 11-0, no hitter in seven innings. It's almost crazy. They had seven singles, eight walks, two hit by pitches. So not a ton of extra base hits. And anytime you're allowed scoring double-digit runs with only three extra base hits, that's just an insane, insane stat. And again, they had a no-hitter on Tuesday. Let's see how long they can kind of keep it going here because, again, they need to be going out and dominating these series against inferior opponents. They have bigger sights than winning the AAC. Yes, Noah? I just want to say that it's hilarious that the way you disrespect this ECU team, <laughs> and then they go out and throw two no-hitters. Two no-hitters. The They're going to be ranked. They're going to be ranked very high. They're going to be ranked accordingly. <laughs> Listen. I, I feel like I, I even have them unranked, and I, I might have them higher than our poll, but I do love this ECU team. They keep getting better. I was worried because, like, the years past, this ECU team had to beat you by hitting the long ball and the extra base hits. They're doing all the things right now, and, man, they have pitching. Trey Savage is just a dude on Friday nights. He would be a dude in any conference, let alone just for ECU this year. So good, big win for them. The no-hitter, though, is the thing that we just wanted to make sure we mentioned because two no-hitters in the same week is just incredible. LSU three at Tennessee six. Tommy White has three hits. Billy Amick comes back. Doesn't need to, he, he he has uh, his appendix removed. Doesn't need it. Hits a home run first swing of that. Dylan uh, Drayling also hits a bomb. This is the one right down the right field line there. Big win for Tennessee, but LSU keeps leaving people on base. They had bases loaded multiple times last night and did not receive a hit. They scored on a pass ball and an error, but they didn't get a hit when they needed. They just can't seem to find offense. I know that we keep talking about this LSU team, but they are now tied for second to last place in SEC standings. They're only above Auburn, and they're tied with Ole Miss. At some point, this LSU team has to look themselves in the mirror and say, we got to turn things around if we want to fix this ball club. Right now, they're on the cusp of being a three seed or seeing their way out of the tournament play right now. They, they're out. They need to I mean, but <laughs> I, I do believe that there's too much talent on this team. I think that they're going to turn things around again, but a big win for this Tennessee team who's, you know, a top five ball club. And they didn't even have any of their normal starting pitching last night. They threw a, a myriad of guys and they went out there and beat LSU at home. Big win for Tennessee. Tough loss for LSU. They've got to figure out a way to get some offense going. Noah, did you have anything you wanted to add on this one for that LSU? It, it's too early to take any kind of victory lap or anything like, you know, we told you so or anything, but I'm not overly surprised about the way that this LSU team is no. playing. Obviously, a few ticks below where they probably should be, but none of us are, are shocked that, that this is a team that isn't on pace to win a national championship, which is something that we get attacked for early on in the year. Long way to go, so I'm not going to talk any more about it. But I'm, I'm going to circle back in late May if things look like this. You bet. Yeah, like I said, a lot of talent on this team. I don't. I, I see their path is still clear. They can still get back into things. But right now it's kind of a mess. Yeah, Jake? Uh, the only thing that like, perplexes me about this LSU team is how Brady Neal just continues to find his way into this lineup. <laughs> he, he's only had one hit in like two years in SEC play. He went over last night again. It, it just blows my mind that he continues to find his way into this lineup. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not Jay Johnson, so I couldn't tell you that answer right now. But I can tell you, if Tommy White's getting three hits and they're still pitching to him, it means that they have no fear of the rest of this lineup. If they're attacking, going right at Tommy White, who's one of the best hitters in the country, they have zero fear of the rest of this lineup. Kansas State, five, at Oklahoma, 12. Jake, I think this is a bigger statement for Oklahoma to continue to win Big 12 games. But Kansas State is kind of going the wrong direction here in Big 12 play. Yeah, um, Oklahoma's the way that they kind of set up their non-conference slate and some of the losses that they've had, I mean, they've had razor, razor thin margins in big 12 play and they've gone out and kind of taken care of business here. Um, I think the solution to OU's woes is just continue to play in the big 12. Easton Carmichael had three hits again. His average is up to 357. People kind of forget he's under the radar as one of the big 12 players of the year. Anthony McKenzie has been great behind him too, as well. And Kansas state. Yeah. They're going the wrong way. Two and five in their last seven in big 12 play. They've lost back-to-back -back series. Again, this isn't really the best place to get a get-right series in Norman, Oklahoma, after they just lost Bedlam. So I, I think that this is kind of where Kansas State needs to seal one. And then when they get back rolling kind of in May, you'll look back and be like, okay, well, at least they still won there against Oklahoma. But again, Kansas State needs to steal one of these next two. Absolutely. And no, I know that you and I both had Kansas State early. We both thought that they might be a fringe Omaha team with the pitching they've had. The pitching's been the thing that's let them down lately. You know, they won the game at UCF with good pitching. Uh, neighbors came in and shut the door. The pitching has really let down Kansas State, and they haven't got the offensive production from the guys that were on the USA Collegiate team as much as they thought that they might. When you look at this ball club, losing another one here in Big 12 play, they, they really have to turn things around, right? Yeah, I think this what we liked about the Kansas State team heading into the year was the edge that we thought that they would have based on being left out of the tournament last year and being good enough to be in. It wasn't just one of those where, oh, we felt like we should have been in. They should have been in the tournament last year. Yeah. And all of a sudden, that edge is gone. They just look like a, another Big 12 team. So I think that that takes a lot away from what we saw what this Kansas State team could be. And I, watching Oklahoma last night, just the way that they hit the ball, it reminds me of that championship appearance team that they had, just timely hitting, single, 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 move them on over. But can they get consistent? I think that's the whole problem with this whole conference is that there's no consistency Right now, there's one team that we'll talk about later that is getting a little bit consistent, but the rest of this league is just so weird. It's turning into the ACC. Yeah, yeah they seem to be beating the worst, each other up. The worst level of the ACC. Oh, we should so, clarify that one. The lower, Thank you, Jake. The lower level. Well, we're going to jump into an ACC team that has caught fire finally, a team that we all thought would be the number one team in the country to start the season and was unanimous across every poll. Wake Forest 13, Boston College 1. You know, Burns goes six and a third, two hits, great. Uh, Seaver King goes has three hits, a home run. Kurtz has another home run. Noah, when you look at this Wake Forest team, they're they're finally catching the fire that we thought that this team could be. They have the talent to be really good. They need to get healthy as they are. But if 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 Burns is going to go out there and start Fridays like this, they're, they're set up for success. Yeah, Chase Burns has really. He was, he was great on Saturday, and then they, they say, okay, can you be great for us on Friday? They move him in that role, and he's been fantastic. It's really the rest of the team. Can they step up? And Nick Kurtz has really taken on that role. I think it's 11 home runs in the last seven games coming back from that injury. He's all the way back, and that's really, really huge for that team. They have some pieces that are coming along. You would like Seaver King to be just a touch better, but he's been really good. I still really believe in this Wake Forest team. I think we're going to have to see them play a little bit stronger competition than, than Boston College. But last night, that 13-1 to 1 victory, they, they looked the part. I want to see them play some stiffer competition in the ACC before I really buy stock in this team being able to win it all again. But I think the pieces are all the way back. I, I think that you can't overlook this Wake Forest team anymore. It's going to be one where when you're talking about resumes later on, the teams that got them when they were down are going to be really, really glad that they did, I think. I agree. I think that their schedule allows them to be great down the stretch here. Uh, through the end of April and into May there and setting themselves up to be competitive in the ACC tournament and put themselves in a position to be one of those national seeds again. But they're going to have to keep winning games like this at Boston College. Arkansas 5, Bama 3, another good outing from Hagen Smith, Jake. Another loss for Bama, though. They just keep piling up now in SEC play for this Bama team that was highly rated. Good win for Arkansas, bad loss for Bama. Or B Bama. <laughs> Bama. Bama. <laughs> uh, the, the battle of the, the A's, as they say, uh, very, very similar logos. Uh, I heard a lot of Arkansas fans, they said they get annoyed when people say Roll Tide when they wear their baseball hats. Um, <laughs> the Hagen-Smith Masterclass, I feel like we've almost run out of superlatives. 
he threw six innings, two hits, six Ks. Uh, Sprogue Lott had the homer that kind of got them going. Again, we've kind of started to see that offense kind of get rolling here a little bit. But again, I think that the thing that really impressed me about it is Will McIntyre, who's just been nails out of the bullpen for him, he was off. And yeah. they had other guys in the bullpen step up behind him. Gackle was really, really good for him. Again, Bamba had that three-run eighth where they almost kind of put you to sleep and then strike there late. But again, what really impressed me, again, is the depth of this Arkansas team. I said it about two weeks ago that if you're going to beat Arkansas, it's going to be in the bullpen. I starting to figure out that I don't know how you're going to beat Arkansas. <laughs> they, they really don't have a formula to it. No, you're going to have to get some fortune your way. You're going to have to get some free passes. You're going to have to get, figure out a way to move guys around. The Arkansas offense doesn't scare me, but that pitching staff is so good. And they got 15 guys they can roll out there and beat you with. And when you got Hagen Smith going on Fridays, that's almost just penciling in a win in SEC play. Big win for Arkansas. <clears throat> Again, Alabama now is 4-9 and nine in SEC play and heading the wrong direction very quickly. They've got to turn things around. But, again, it's Arkansas. It's not so much of a fun slate this weekend. Notre Dame 0. It's a good you team would... to get right with, those Arkansas Reds. Yeah, it's never a good team to get right with when you're like, oh, we got to beat Arkansas for a weekend. That's going to be super fun. Notre Dame 0, UNC 13. Noah, North Carolina continues to beat who they're supposed to beat. Yeah, this is a Carolina team that I continue to doubt every week. And then they go out and they just keep beating the teams that they should beat, which is kind of weird when you're in the ACC. You expect yeah. them to just kind of find ways to lose instead of find ways to win. But this this Carolina team, they have the right pieces. Vance Honeycutt hasn't even been that strong, and they've been able to rise up around him. Alberto Azuna has been fantastic for him this year. But Jason DeCaro on the mound last night. Nails, obviously in a shutout. Six innings pitch, three hits. And then Casey Cook going yak for him yesterday. He was – Shout out to Monty, an ACC All Star, and he showed up. He showed why last night. He was an ACC All Star picked by Mark Garland because I said he is a <laughs> stud. Yeah, I really like what UNC is doing. They are beating who they're supposed to beat, which is something that has not happened this year in ACC for some of these better teams. UNC just keeps putting themselves in the right position to win and taking care of business. Folger Boas, great Friday night guy for a freshman, just tremendous effort this year, and and to go out there and shut down this Notre Dame team. We know that Notre Dame's down. Still good to go get those wins on Fridays. It doesn't matter who you're playing, especially when you're playing in conference. They can Team hit. Like, I mean, there's streaky levels of hitting. Like they yeah, can't. But then some, they have games where they get one run. Yeah. So again, yeah. So you got you got to take what you can get. It get the wins. They're they're beating who they're supposed to beat, Jake. And that's what I'm going to stick with with this UNC team. Another team that could have really used a win on Friday. That's kind of been up and down a little bit. But Clemson at home loses to NC State, 11 to eight. Eli Serrano, three for four, three RBIs, big, big game for NC State. The big thing for me, Jake, that I was looking at, Shane Van Dam comes in four and two-thirds of relief and really shuts down this Clemson offense when they were down, and NC State comes all the way back to win this game. What were your takes from this game, Jake? I mean, this is just like the ACC is its finest. NC State's losers of five straight coming in. They got swept with one of the lower teams, Louisville. Clemson has been in the conversation with Arkansas to be the number one team in the country with some of the wins that they've stacked up. And uh, NC State has eight runs across two innings in the fourth and fifth inning. It's just <laughs> a crazy, crazy league this year with the ACC. Every team, it feels like, is just so good, and every team's giving you your best shot. Pennington had some great hits. Again, his average is up really, really high. Um, I, I still do not understand his name. Makerwitz, the kid from ECU, he had two hits. He was in the, the, you know, the home run derby for the ACC. Shout out to Monty again. But again... The three errors, I'd like to see them kind of clean it up. But the flip side of that is, I mean, if you're winning when you have three errors, you really almost should have won by more. Yeah, and they didn't even get a great performance from the starting pitcher. Like I said, Shane Van Dam had to come out of the pin and really shut that team down. So big for NC State to go out there and go get this win on the road, especially after losing five straight ACC games. Statement. Statement went. <laughs> they needed it. Miami has played two already against Florida State and lost both. They lost 4-5 and 7-11. Big wins for Florida State. Um, when you look at this, though, Noah, Florida State just keeps finding ways to win. And against Miami, that's that's good wins. I mean, Miami doesn't really perform well on the road like other teams in the ACC. But this team has got to keep winning if you're Florida State. you got to be pretty happy with your performance so far this weekend. Yeah, this is a Florida State team that, like you just said, they always they find ways to win, which is so opposite of what we've seen from the last few years for this Florida State team. <laughs> Yeah. I know we've always liked uh, Link Jarrett, but I feel like he's finally able to have that culture he wants, which is such a cliche. But you can see the difference between 
obviously year one and year two, but even year two to year zero is such a massive gap between where this team was and where it is. They're, they're fun to watch. They find ways to win and they're beating their rivals. They beat Florida earlier this week. Now they're beating Miami. This Florida state team has an identity and James Tibbs is going to win ACC player of the year. If he continues the pace, he's at national RBI leader. Obviously Nick Kurtz is back now and is gunning for a little bit of a Sosa McGuire situation but he's been phenomenal. This rotation is dynamic and they're hurt this week and they plug in somebody else and he still dominates. So this is a still wins. a Florida state team that has not only gotten strong at the top, but they have depth from top to bottom. This is a team that I'm getting ready to pencil into Omaha. It's unbelievable what Link Jarrett has done in, in just a couple of years down there in, in Tallahassee. We did talk about it in our preseason shows. We said if Link can somehow get this Florida state team to be a top 25, he should be considered for coach of the year. He's there. I mean, for for all things considered, this Florida State to be where they're at from a year ago and two years ago is incredible to see where they're at. This is a team that made the tournament for 60-plus straight years and then was out for the last two. Incredible to see where Link Jarrett has taken this team. I believe that this Florida State team, I, I didn't know how good they were. You keep watching games like, okay, they keep winning. They figure out ways to win. Now I'm I'm impressed after they could just keep this up in the ACC. They have some more series coming up, but I'm very impressed with this Florida State team so far at the midpoint season. Mississippi State, eight. Old Miss, zero. Panic button, we'll talk about later for Old Miss, is just pressed and held down at this point. Uh, Dakota Jordan, homers. But the big thing here is Cal Steven, eight innings pitch, three run or, or eight innings pitch, three hits, zero runs, nine Ks. His progression to being a Friday night dude in SEC play, it, it's it's incredible. And I know we've all talked about it, but when I look at this Mississippi State team, this is a team that we all had near the bottom of the rankings, not at the bottom. They've put themselves in the middle here and, and battling for, you know, upper middle. I'm very impressed by this Mississippi State team, and, and Ole Miss is going the complete opposite direction for me. Anything to add on that one, Jake? Um, I was just going to say, they're almost playing their way into an SEC buy. I mean, just the yeah. tremendous growth that we've seen uh, from the starting pitcher. I forget his name. His name just escapes me right there. I know you just said it. But again, Cal Steven. He had a really, really flat fastball to kind of start the season. And he really worried me going into SEC play that he was going to be able to kind of do that. But again, Mississippi State just almost seems to kind of get these guys where you almost doubt their ability. And then they go out and throw seven innings and strike out a ton. But again, as the more things change at Mississippi State, the more they stay the same. It always <laughs> seems like that, you know, daddy's home when they play Ole Miss. Uh, I don't think Ole Miss has won a series since 2015 against Mississippi State. So, again, it, it, count the wins when you can get them, but you can always kind of sharpie in wins against Ole Miss for Mississippi State. Well, this series is far from over. They still got two more games here. But I am I, I will say I am impressed by Mississippi State's effort and, and shutting out this Ole Miss team. Who can hit? They can hit. To shut them out is a big, big statement there for Cal Steven. Noah, going to another SEC series. Kentucky continues to impress. I don't I don't think there's enough things we can say. They don't really have a superstar. They don't have anybody that blows your mind when you watch them play. But they keep winning games and they keep winning road games on the SEC, which is something that nobody's doing right now. Kentucky won 6-5 against Auburn on Thursday. They win 6-1 yesterday. Auburn's going the wrong direction, but you got to be impressed by Kentucky. Yeah, the, even though Auburn does not have the record to show it, I still think that that's a really good ball club. I know one win in, in conference play, it's like, oh, look at me. I'm, I like Auburn. But this is a really good Auburn team talent-wise. They just haven't put it together. Kentucky, however, is putting it together with – and I know I don't want this to come up the wrong way with not as much talent as compared to a lot of SEC teams, but they just have the one loss in conference play. They're getting ready to rival Arkansas at the top in terms of Omaha level teams. We got to give credit to AJ here. He was all over them, but uh, yeah. Grant, Grant Smith, Ryan Waldschmidt last night, going back to back, just kind of that feel that they have. They're a scary team to play. I think last year's Kentucky team, they kind of just found ways to win. And you thought, Oh, Kentucky won again. But now I think Kentucky has a different edge to them where they're kind of frightening to play. Um, obviously, Auburn, don't know what their problem is, but Kentucky, really, really strong. Feels like every time we do the show, they've already won an SEC series. They did it again. <laughs> it's crazy to look at this team because, it, it, like I said, there's no superstars on offense. You don't see anything crazy there. They win by pitching and defense, and doing it on the road is a lot harder than people think in SEC. Yeah, Kentucky has a gigantic ballpark, so when teams come in there, it's hard to play. It's hard to hit balls out of the ballpark. It's not SEC play necessarily. But they're going on the road and winning this series. I'm Every week I get more and more impressed with this Kentucky team. 
they're sitting at top of the standings. They're they're twelve or uh, thir- thirteen and one now in conference play. They're, I don't know how else to put it. This team has just been electric this year. They put themselves in that conversation to host and possibly be a national seed. All right, Jake. Coastal Carolina continues to just blow my mind whether they win or lose i just don't understand i can't put my finger on a pulse for this team they win last night seven to three against georgia southern i don't understand coastal they sometimes can hit 15 home runs and then they'll come out the next night and not hit a single ball out of the ballpark please explain a little bit about this coastal team for me please explain something honest, i cannot get a feel for this team at all and you know <laughs> it was it was seven three but we should put a little asterisk as it was four three as it scored three in the nights they were yeah. down three, two in the six I didn't want to jinx it, but I was kind of watching that one close. The bullpen, I think, was really tremendous for them. They get to find three scoreless innings. It's again, in tight ball games are really going to be key. Georgia Southern is one of the best teams in the Sun Belt. Um, I, I did want to tease a little bit, but they're starting to kind of run out of time to catch Louisiana in front of them. They're not sweeping teams like they should be sweeping in years past. They're just kind of handling their business, taking care of two of three. And – from what I knew about the Sun Belt going in, the teams that I thought were going to be good are kind of going in the wrong direction. So it really isn't as deep of a Sun Belt as we thought going in. So again, Coastal has to kind of clean up, you know, button that top button a little bit if they want to kind of play in. Because again, the way that the Sun Belt's kind of shifting back a little bit, they are going to have to start to steal some of these series and sweeps. They got to go get sweeps, and I don't know if they're going to do it the way they've been playing so inconsistent this year. We know they have the talent. We know that at home they're really tough to deal with hitting ballpark there. But on the road, that just seems to be a whole other story for them. Speaking of Louisiana, they beat Marshall last night 3-1 in kind of an interesting ball game there, really good pitching performance. Jake, again, Louisiana is kind of pushing themselves to the top of the Sun Belt and holding on to it. Yeah, they are four up quietly on Coastal Carolina. And again, this is the Marshall team that just beat West Virginia in a midweek. Vibes are really, really high, and UNL just has a master class. I think the thing that really impresses me the most is obviously, you know, they had the nation's longest winning streak that got snapped on Tuesday at yeah. Louisiana Tech, is they win games in a variety of different ways. They can score double-digit runs and get in shootouts. They can win these 3-0, 2-0 games. I think that that's what really impresses me. And then Trey LaFleur, the old Miss transfer, I think he's the one that's really impressed me. Miss basically all of 2023 was ineffective, one for 25, now bouncing back, hitting 412 on the season. He had two hits last night. He's kind of going to get in that conversation of Sun Belt Player of the Year going forward. And again, this is a Louisiana team that I saw in Houston that really didn't impress me. And they are just like flipped to switch, and they look like one of the most unstoppable teams in the country. They're a team that you don't really want to see in a regional and again, they're starting to kind of play their way into being a host because, you know, the committee loves to have that one team from a mid-major that hosts. Yeah, especially with a team like UC Irvine losing last night and losing two this week, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. They love to have a mid-major host, and Louisiana continues to win. They're going to find themselves right on the border of that 16 spot. I just, Let's, Mark, if I may, absolutely. Uh, a Louisiana host would be arguably the greatest thing to ever happen to college baseball. <laughs> Uh, I believe it was 2013 when they hosted uh, against Ole Miss in a super. Maybe it wasn't a super. Maybe it was a re- it was something. It was, it was regional. Okay. Uh, phenomenal environment, and I know that they like to lower the price of beer there. Uh, unbelievable environment. You could. It's like wide open behind home plate. God, I, it would be a dream to see a regional in Louisiana. I heard that they have like catfish. In the like, they sell catfish at the concessions. <laughs> fried catfish. Hey, fried catfish is next level, bro. I I am from the Pacific Northwest. We don't get that. I come down to <laughs> South. I always try to get me some catfish or gator. It's freaking delightful. I I'm gonna, gonna try and get out there for a, a Lafayette. It's only about I think it's about three hours from Houston. So I'm you might get some live coverage from uh, the University of Louisiana. Not three the hours. It's crazy to me. University of Louisiana. It's crazy to me how many schools are within three hours of you. I drive three <laughs> hours to barely get to Corvallis. So thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> let's go on to the next one here. Vandy zero, A&M 15. A&M just continues to put it on people in the SEC. And, and the offense is just something else. Braden Montgomery has really been terrific. And the rest of this A&M lineup continues to perform. But really, for me, it's the pitching staff, and holding Vandy to zero was a big start last night. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that a complete game 10K shutout is the footnote of a game. But again, (laughs) Ryan Prager just continued to do Ryan Prager things. He pounds the zone at just an unbelievable rate. 
his pitch count is super, super low. And again, the thing that really impressed me about Texas A&M is I know the home runs are going to steal all the headlines, but just the unselfish hitting. There were a ton of guys that had two strike counts with runner on third less than two outs, and they choked up and put the ball in play to get a run home. They had a ton of backside strong hits. Ted Burton had a backside home run. Jace Lavalette had the backside home run. Uh, Braden Montgomery, again, his two kind of went to the left of the batter's eye. But again, I think that that's what's really impressed me the most about Texas A&M is the unselfishness in a 10 nothing game to choke up, put the ball in play. The ability to kind of take extra bases on doubles, I think really kind of stood out to me as well. Take extra bases on triples. And again, it almost kind of felt like they played like Vandy. The Vandy that we've kind of come to expect where they do all the little things right, take the extra bases. And again, that's what really impressed me the most. And again, I drove home for about an hour after College Station last night. I couldn't find a single guy that had a bad game. They had no errors. Every guy had a hit. Eight of nine had multi-hits. Eight of nine scored runs. Uh, the only pitcher was a complete game shutout. It was just an A-plus effort against a really, really talented Vandy team. A, team. a Vandy team that's been winning ball games in SEC play, too. And to be able to hold your home ground like this is huge for A&M, especially come tournament time. I know that we all think that they're probably going to be a national seed, and they are well-deserved of that. Really good effort from A&M. Love seeing what they're doing right now. Just a crazy turnaround with the starting pitching this year. That's all I wanted to mention on that. Uh, I did want to add one thing before no, we go ahead. on, Mark. Vandy yep. left more people on base than A&M did. They left four and A&M only left three. Well, if you score 15 of your runs, you're not leaving it's that many just... people on base, Jake. <laughs> you score 15 insane. runs, you're not leaving that many on base. You score zero, you're leaving people on base. Come on. <laughs> okay. UC Irvine, four, UCSD, 15. Listen, the Forks, I feel bad for this UCSD team because they the forks, cannot. They're, they're tridents. I, it's the Forks, bro. <laughs> Get on the West Coast. Uh, so they can't play in postseason this year. But they continue to beat really good teams. They knocked Nick Pinto out in the second inning. Nick Costello has five hits for them, two homers and a double for UCSD. Noah... Nothing but impressed by this UC San Diego team. Yeah, this is, you know, the, the buzz from the program is this is the biggest win school history. That's what they're saying. This UC Irvine team was hot, 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 and then UCSD not only wins the game but blows them out. Nick Costello, four RBIs for him last night. Uh, Anthony Ionson on the mound was dominant, which is not yeah. some not something that anybody's been able to say against this UC Irvine team this year. The Anteaters, explosive offensively, completely shut down. Got to see if they can hang on and win, and win this series, but – it's a great time to be a uh, uh, fork, as the kids are saying. Uh, what, what an outstanding uh, win for that program. This is a team that they can't play in the postseason yet, I believe. Or are they eligible now? No, nope, they're not they're eligible for next yet. season. Didn't so they, they win it last year? Didn't they win the Big no, West last year? No, CSUN, same problem mm -hmm. for CSUN last yeah. year. They were bumped up, and they couldn't win the conference. So Fullerton ended up winning the conference. Same exact problem for UC San Diego this year. They can't win the conference. They can only win it next year. But they've got to find those special moments during the regular season, and this was one of those. I think this is one that the program can kind of build on because they don't have those postseason wins. Every regular season game is your postseason. Great win for the Tritons. That's Great still a rule that I do not get in any way, shape, or form. I have been I, on, to me on the best Coast times, show. Yeah. And it still doesn't make sense to me. I said it on the best Coast show. I'm like, I get it if you go down a conference. If you are going to the highest conference in college baseball – you should be allowed to play in postseason play that year. It's ridiculous that they can't allow these teams to play there. Just just insane to me. There's no other higher level. It's not like they're going to another D1 higher section. This is the ridiculous. SEC. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, we'll see that here soon when they blow up the NCAA. <laughs> South Carolina 10, Florida 3. Florida's woes continue. They can't seem to get wins on Fridays. They can't seem to win games. South Carolina finally comes alive. The pitching staff look great. Noah, this was a big win for South Carolina, but maybe, maybe, maybe a bigger loss for Florida. Yeah, at this point, Florida needs everything they can get. When you're losing the midweeks, uh, usually the way it's worked out for them is they go and win the weekend series. But now you're really starting to see the cracks in the armor when they struggle on the weekend, too. But I, I, I'm almost going to say that this was equally as big for South Carolina because this is a team yeah. that they've been hot, they've been cold. We can't really get a read on, read on them, kind of just like Florida, but with the Florida National Championship expectations, you kind of blow it up and say that things are in a crisis. Whereas South Carolina, I think, had the opportunity to be maybe just a few ticks below them and be a strong super regional team. This is a South Carolina team that I think we 
We know it's playing just a little bit below expectations, and this is one that can really kickstart them. The problem with Florida, TJ or Jack Caglione can't do everything for this team. Yeah, and exactly. that's well, he did have Tommy John, Noah. So, you know, thank you. All that. Yeah, thank Well, he, he, there he goes. He cannot do every single thing for this program. And I don't know what the answer is. I know that there, there are some injuries throughout the, the, the Florida ball club, but this is a, a team that I wasn't tremendously worried about a week ago. But now all of a sudden, my, my panic level has like doubled with this Florida team. So I, I don't know what to get, what to make of this one. But I think that South Carolina is in a, a position to go on a little bit of a run in SEC play. I think that this is the kind of series that can get them right. But this is a Florida team that, like I kind of just said, is is losing my trust more and more as as the outs pile up. Yeah, we just assume Florida's going to turn it around, right? We keep saying, oh, they're going to figure it out. They're going to get it going, right? They have enough talent. We think that they're good. Every team that is in D1 baseball has been dealing with some sort of injuries this year, and, and a lot of teams have overcome them. Florida is one that has not overcome it. South Carolina is a team that is trying to battle back from all their injuries, and they seem to be doing the right things. Cole Messina was back. Big, big for him to be back behind the dish there for South Carolina. Big win for South Carolina. Tough loss for Florida. They've got the rest of the weekend here at home to try to figure this one out. If South Carolina wins another game on the road, it'd be just massive for the South Carolina team heading for the rest of SEC. Yeah, if they could go 3-3 three and three against Florida and Texas A&M, that's yeah. a success for South Carolina. And again, massive. I do want to add one thing that kind of worries me about the South Carolina team. They seem to always kind of need to rely on somebody else. And that's the thing that really kind of worries me going forward about them. I think that they're an elite, elite, elite level SEC team. And they kind of – we move them under the microscope a little bit. But, again, I think that that's the one thing that kind of worries me about South Carolina. Hey, but when they take advantage of those mistakes. Yes, they take advantage of them like nobody else in the conference. That's the big thing. That's the big difference for me is that South Carolina, when they get a little – when they when they get that inch, they take it a mile. Texas Tech 7, TCU 1. My goodness, Noah. I, I just don't even know what to say at this point. TCU getting hot, or Texas Tech getting hot. TCU has fallen completely off the face of the planet. Yeah, I, I don't know what to make of this TCU team. Kind of similar to Auburn, except TCU is on a little bit of a better scale just because I thought TCU had kind of written their names into Omaha and maybe they were looking at hotels before the season started. I know Jake was all over it, and I'm sure he'll victory lap in a second here. But the TCU team, it's not like you can point to anything and say, oh, that's their problem. It's just not right, which is really frustrating to watch a program go from coming in, in what, third or fourth technically in Omaha last year to now not even going to be making the tournament at this rate, which is really, really gross to see. But Ryan Free, strong for Texas Tech last night. TJ Pompey just continues to be great in his freshman season down in Lubbock. Uh, we always talk about how Texas Tech can't win on the road. Last night they won on the road, six and four on the road this year, and they won eight in a row overall. So it might be time to start talking about the Red Raiders as much as we talk about what's wrong with, with TCU. Yeah, we got a couple teams that have kind of turned the corner right, and, and that's Texas Tech, Oklahoma State. They kind of seem to right to their own ships and figure this thing out. But, Jake, TCU keeps falling apart, and, this, and they're just not finding ways to win. Even at home, not finding ways to win. That's just brutal. Yeah, I mean, this was kind of just, I think, the epitome of what's gone wrong with TCU. They only had five hits. The bullpen really let them down. Peyton Tolley was good enough if considering what they had last year. I mean, they would have won this game if they had this last year again. I wouldn't pull the stats. The low point last year of TCU season was they had back-to-back -back series losses, and they were 8-12 and 12 at the end of April. And that was before they kind of got it started rolling there. They had that trip out to Fullerton. But I think the thing that really worries me about this TCU team is they're not as athletic as they were last year. And I think that that's kind of what got them going was they were high energy guys that were athletic that could bunt for hits when they couldn't get on. I don't really see that from this team this year. It seems like that they have to kind of string together a whole bunch of hits or hit home runs. Peyton Shadier, I think that that was kind of going to be somebody that they counted on a little bit more. Yes, no. Shot un yay. Shot, Shot yay. In, yes, I think that he was going to be somebody that they kind of wanted to count on for. But again, I think that the the pieces are still there for TCU to kind of get it rolling, but they are quickly, quickly, quickly running out of time. And it's going to have to start with somebody outside of Peyton Tolley. It's going to have to start with somebody outside of Carson Bowen. I think that those are going to be the guys that you kind of do it. And then the flip side of that, I'm done being negative. Texas Tech won a game where Cap and <laughs> Bazell went two, and four, two for 14. Like just the depth of this lineup is insane. They started to kind of get going. TJ Pompey. Um, 
okay. is starting to get rolling there for him. He had three RBIs. Again, it's looking like a collision course for Texas Tech, Oklahoma State there in the Big 12. Well, I'm going to speak about that next. Cincinnati 4, Oklahoma State 8, another great start on Friday night for Oklahoma State. They have found ways to start winning ball games again after their loss at UCF. They've turned it around and they've started winning Big 12 series and they're just doing it against good teams. You know, they beat Oklahoma last weekend, beating Cincinnati who who we would say was not a good team, but they just swept TCU. So they have to be pretty good at baseball to be able to sweep TCU, even if it's at home. So a good win for Oklahoma State to go out there and get that one. Speaking of UCF, they go and lose 6-7 to West Virginia. West Virginia getting their starter back, J.J. Weatherford. They're, if he is getting hot, this West Virginia team can roll with him, right? So this team has the ability to be a really good team. We had them as a sleeper team early. UCF has a hard time winning road games. We know that already in the Big 12. They are a ranked team, but they're going to drop out of this ranking if they can't figure out how to win some road games in the Big 12 play. Stanford 0, Oregon State 6. Big shutout there for Oregon State. Aiden May finally threw his full first game of the season since Arkansas. He was out there for 6-plus. Really good start for him to get the shutout. And Oregon State just keeps taking care of business, winning 6-0. They have not lost a game at home this season. They are undefeated at Goss, and they have, I think it's a 21-game win streak now at home at Goss. Nebraska six. Wait, Mark, Rutgers. before we move on, I think that that should almost count as double because USC is one of the tougher teams in the country to beat on a Friday night, and Oregon State made it look really, really easy. Stanford? They played Sorry. Stanford. Yeah. <laughs> USC played at Oregon, and, and Oregon won that one. You know what? Them. I just need to stop talking about Pac-12. Pac <laughs> I'm ready for it to die. <laughs> yes, Noah. Mark, I, I was just looking at our uh, kind of outline for the show, and I don't see Oregon State on here. Did you just kind of uh... – like, why would you bring them up just randomly? It's kind of weird. Are you, oh, I have, are, are you an Oregon added, State fan or something? It's on the you special mark notes. I always add my footnotes at the bottom of the Yeah, he's got the rundowns of the game. I used to talk like, about yeah, my last six rundown teams that I like to talk about. Teams that you expect I, to win, win. I'm only seeing <laughs> four games here, but you need, whatever. Let's hear about how great Oregon State is. I get it. It's all right. I have uh, Utah and Arizona State I added at the end also. Oh, yeah. You're just, about, so. All right. <laughs> I have to throw out some West Coast teams for you Houston guys. Houston beat Texas. I'm trying to keep you all educated across the nation. Everybody that's watching the show, trying to make sure that they understand Pac-12 baseball is still alive, even if it feels dead. Speaking of, Nebraska 6, Rutgers 7, bad loss there, Noah. <laughs> this allegation that I'm a Nebraska fan, <laughs> every time something bad happens in the Nebraska athletic department, I'm throwing like a pizza party for myself. <laughs> so, good. Let's go Rutgers. You know, I always, I always say, I always say, I always say, Jake, the Rutgers uh, athletic department is a hero in this house. End of story. End of story. <laughs> End of story. DBU three, Air Force two. Good win on Friday night for DBU, but the offense seems to be just all over the place, especially in road series. Uh, Air Force, not a bad team, but DBU has got to figure out a way to get that offense rolling again if they want to be a top 16 team like they're hoping to host. Utah 10, Arizona State 0. Willie Bloomquist and Arizona State really shut down. I'll talk more about that with my something cool, but a huge win on the road for Utah, and they continue to impress in Pac-12 play. All right, who wants to start? I'm going to let Jake start because Noah's a little salty right now. So who did something <laughs> cool, Jake? I got two for you. Uh, Northwestern walking off Maryland, one of the upper echelon teams of the Big Ten, for their first Big Ten win. When Tony Livermore delivered there in the 10th, um, Northwestern, again, uh, we've heard, talked about sky high expectations. They had sky low expectations, <laughs> but this is their 11th win of the season. So, you know, this is like the equivalent of Arkansas winning 60. Uh, so credit to Northwestern there for the walk-off. And then the Baylor Bears, they sit at 7-7 seven and seven in Big 12 play. Um, they went and took two to get the series against BYU. Um, it is their first road series conference win in three years. They scored two in the ninth to tie it. Then Kemp had a double in the tenth to give them the lead. So credit to the Baylor Bears again. I think that this is one of the better Baylor teams we've seen in a long, long time. Still not tournament worthy, but again, credit to Baylor there for going out on the road and, and getting their first series dub. It's not necessarily a pencil in Baylor loss in the Big 12 anymore. They will not be in the tournament, in my opinion, but – Good for them. I think in everybody's opinion, if, if, if you <laughs> think, vote Baylor I don't think that's an unpopular tournament, opinion. your yeah. vote should be rescinded. <laughs> Noah, who did something cool this week? 
I'm going to have to go with the low-hanging fruit. We already talked about it, of course, but ECU, two no-hitters in a week, especially yeah. to spite Jake. Uh, <laughs> Trey <laughs> Savage, everybody talks about Higgins Smith and his dominance, and for good reason, but the the National Pitcher of the Year race, per se, is, is not a one-horse race. It's a two-horse race with Trey Savage down there. You can say, oh, it's different in the SEC, but the reality is that when you go out there and you uh, give up no hits, you're doing that against Division One hitters and, and – fringe power five hitters down the AAC um, outstanding year he's having, and he's just a part of the cog there for, for ECU. Obviously if you have two combined, no hitters going, but it's time to talk about the ECU pirates pitching staff is one of the more underrated in the country. Yes. And, and we have been trying to bring it up every single weekend that this team can pitch. They're, they're really good. And they're, they're going to be a problem for somebody. Who are you pointing at? That'd be Jake. Oh, yeah. for, on my it's screen, the wrong way the there, opposite buddy. direction. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's, it's this way on my screen. It is not on our screen. It's the it's other way this. for us. <laughs> yes, Jake is the problem. Uh, my something cool, of course, ties to that Utah game. Utah's starting pitcher, Bryson Van Sickle, he went 82 pitches for a complete game shutout against Arizona State. We don't have 10 run rules in the Pac 12 because we're better and we play the full game. <laughs> uh, he did not allow a runner past first base. He only gave up three hits, but no runner got past first base in that game. So huge win there, especially with the 82 pitch complete game shutout against Arizona State. It was it was just insane to watch him shut down this team. And that was at home for Arizona State, a ball club, ballpark where they crush it usually, and he shut them down. So big win for Utah. Big shout out to Bryson Van Sickle. Uh, I also had another one that Nick Costello five hits two home runs and a double against UC Irvine, a team that's been really one of the top 10 teams in the country this year uh, to be at home, knowing that you're not going to get a postseason going out there and getting five hits, two home runs and a double Nick Costello hats off to you, sir. All right. We're going back to our segment that we just created last week that people really seem to like. I think we enjoyed talking about it maybe more than anybody else around the country, but I thought it was pretty good. And, and we're going to dive right back in. One to ten. One relax, ten blow it up, your whole season's over. What are you gonna do? LSU, Jake, you didn't get to do this segment last week, so I'm gonna let you start here with this LSU ball club. One to ten, where do you rank this as far as their season? One relax, ten blow it up. Uh seven. <laughs> it is panic time in Baton Rouge. Tommy White again had three hits, they still lose. Uh, the entire fate of LSU's tournament hopes, I think, rests on Luke Holman's ability to go out and win start. I think that he's kind of the only, not necessarily hope that they have, but he's the one that you kind of feel really good about if you're an LSU fan about him on the mound. So I think Gage Jump would be a good Saturday guy where if they had him last year with the lineup that they have. But again, the, the razor thin margins of this LSU pitching staff, I think, is forced to sometimes. I think it is really puts a ton of pressure on them. And again, I thought of Tommy White, there's just no consistency. You can count on Travinsky to kind of give you two RBIs a weekend, but outside of that, he really doesn't do a lot. Bear Jones, if it's a non lefty, he can kind of hit. But again, outside of those guys, it's just a abyss. They don't have any heart to their team, I don't think. They just kind of go out there, throw their shit on the field, and say, All right, I guess we're playing baseball today. Yeah. I I have them at an eight and it's, it's not my personal feeling that I'm going to hit the panic button. Cause I didn't, I, I had projected that this team would struggle offensively. My, my problem is that I figured that pitching, they'd be a little bit better. And the fact that they're just having trouble finding anybody outside of Luke Coleman to go out there and compete for them every single weekend and be more consistent. That's tough. Gage jump will be good. I don't have any issues with Gage jump. I think he will be a very good starting pitcher. I think that there's just an inconsistency problem for LSU. And when I look at this team and seeing where they've put themselves now at this point in the season, trying to get back into SEC play, they're way out of the hosting conversation and they're slowly playing their way out of the tournament conversation. Um, but I think that they'll get in, they have enough talent, but it's still an eight for me in the panic as far as what their expectations were versus what we thought they might be. Noah, where do you have this LSU squad? I know you rated them last weekend. Yeah, I think I had him at a six and a half last week. I'm going to meet Jake at a seven this week. Yep. Um, I know that Alex, kind of a resident LSU guy, is is probably even higher than a seven than than I, than us. Uh, but um, he makes the point that if they don't 
find a way to win at least one game. It might be curtains on the season, which I, I always think that it's it's too early to look ahead like that. But he kind of has a point. And when the LSU people are saying that, the fan base that you know never takes the rose colored glasses off, I think that that's when you actually start to get near that panic button. I trust Jay Johnson generally, um, but I think that this is a team that, as we have kind of said all year, is a bridge and not necessarily a team that is competing to win a, cha- a championship, which LSU fans are just going to have to accept. At this point in the season, they only have three conference wins, which is just crazy now. They're 3-10 and 10 in conference play. Even if they won two-thirds of their conference games down the stretch, they would not be in that considered where you have to be at the 13, 14, 15 wins to be able to be tournament bound. They're really on that borderline now. Yes, they won a lot of non-conference games, but their non-conference schedule does not help them at all. It is a mess. It is not good. They yeah, Xavier's play. kind of playing down. Yeah, all the teams that they beat. As good as, yeah. Even Texas is bad. So, yeah. like, when you look at it, it's just really abysmal at that full full conference and full non-conference schedule for LSU. So that's why I have them at an eight. I think the panic is setting in. But they still have time to turn their season. They have a lot of talent. Another team that we talked about a little bit earlier, Florida. Florida's all over the board, Jake. They seem to can't win a midweek. Now they're losing weekend series. Where do you have this team on the panic? I'd go three. Because I feel like they have a ton of talent around them, and they almost kind of remind me of like 2000, uh, 2022 Arkansas, where they had all the pieces. The fan base freaked the hell out right around this time. Um, I think that they'll figure it out. They have the offense to beat anybody in the country. They go about six or seven deep. Neely, I think if they can get somebody to step up and move him kind of into that fourth reliever, for I mean fourth starter reliever role, I think that ha- that's where he really shines the best. Uh, they have the probably best Sunday starter in CAGS. They, they're going to be in a position to win every Sunday game, which, again, I think is a benefit. And, again, I think that they're just in a lull right now where they, they need almost the series to kind of slap them in the face. Hey, you know, you aren't as good as you think they are, and I think that they're just kind of taking clubs right now with that. It's not really ready to, to hit the panic button down there in Gainesville. Jake, that wasn't last week getting swept by Missouri. Like, that felt like the slap in the face that they needed. And then they go out, they lose the midweek, and then they lose uh, the first game of the weekend here. Canes, Cats, Heat, 305, yes, from the ACC show. I I am looking at this Florida squad, and I just keep saying, yeah, they have the talent. Yeah, they have the talent. Well, that record is getting closer and closer to 500 only, and they're not doing it in SEC play. And the sweep against Mizzou, the, I'm at a 10. I'm at this, this Florida team is full panic. This is a team that expected to be in Omaha playing for a national championship. And at this point, they're not hosting. They're not a two seed. They're they're on the fringe of being left out of a tournament. If they keep playing like this, I think that they'd get in. But it's a 10 on the panic scale because they can't seem to figure out anything outside of Jack Keggs. Noah, where do you have this team? I should have really written down the numbers I said last week. But seven and a half feels right in my eyes. Just because of kind of like what I was saying last week, we expected this team to be penciled into Omaha and possibly that national championship series. That's what we thought of this Florida team. They're certainly falling short of that right now. But I kind of liked where Jake went with the the comparison there with with 22 Arkansas. But I'm going to go a little different and say 2023 Tennessee, where you look at the Tennessee team, they just don't ever feel right. They're winning the occasional game, but you wonder just what's not clicking there. And then they did finally get to Omaha at the end. I don't know if that's how it's going to work out for this Florida team, but you can see the pieces. You see the pieces that are playing well for them, and you can see the pieces that aren't playing well, and you just have to get those guys to step up. So I think that they're in a better position than a team we'll talk about later, TCU, where you you can kind of tell what the issue is with Florida. You can't really tell what the issue with TCU is. That's next right now, Noah. I'm going to let you start right up with TCU because they're very next. Hey, just, for, for, just tee for it me, up, Noah. For, for me, TCU's a 10 also because the, I can't – figure out where their mistakes are there. It's all over the board. It's everybody. It's there's no one piece. Anthony Silva was a guy we were talking about being a golden spikes finalist and he's just not performing like he needs to, you know, they're not getting the production from this lineup. They're not getting the production from pitching. They're not winning games at home. Like it's not like they're just a struggling on the road team. This is a 10 for me for TCU. Noah, where do you have them? I'm still not going to go to a 10 just because I think that they have the pieces. If this was a team that had more injuries or had reason to believe that, some players were going to really take a significant decline, then I would be I would be up there with you. But I'm going to go with an eight and a half 
which is still awfully high because I'm high. I'm really generous on the panic meter. I'm I'm really low on every yeah. team. Uh, so eight and a half is kind of like a twelve for on the mark scale. <laughs> but um, this is a TCU team that they have all the pieces. I think that if they start winning, they they can control their own destiny. Still, this is a Big Twelve that they can benefit from struggling in. But right now, they got to turn it around pretty quickly because when you're, it's one thing when you lose a road series, fine, go ahead and even get swept on the road. But now they're losing at home as well. This just isn't a team that we've ever thought really looked the part of a national champion, and that was my preseason pick. Yeah, and, and I kept looking, you know, last week, and I was sitting there, I was at Goff Stadium, I kept pulling up, I'm like, oh, they're losing to Cincinnati, but they'll come back and win that one. I mean, they're going to win this game, and then they lose. You're like, oh, and they lose again, and then they lose again. And you're like, what is happening? The walls are falling apart there. Jake, what do you um, have? I'm going to go season? nine. Yeah, that's fair. part of me wants to say that they are running out of chances quickly. I mean, the Big 12 is completely wide open, but again, I think they sit six back of first. So they're yep. really – they're in last right now. Uh, now, I guess this is going to be the comparison show because it <laughs> reminds me of 2023 Louisville. I cannot figure out why they keep losing these uh, teams. Yeah. yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They, like they had a good non-conference slate. A lot of people had them really high. And you. they get conference play and you're like, okay, they got to – the steward died. They got to win. They got to win. Lose. Okay, they got to win this one. They got to win – they are like – quickly 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 turning into hey we need to sweep every single team for the next month to even get in a position to get in the tournament yeah, they, are, they have to win every series from here on right. out yeah they have to they win might even miss series. the big 12 tournament in in arlington they might not even have a chance to go in and steal a bit yeah let's go to another team that is also struggling in the big 12 texas this Texas team, I can't figure out. Um, I'll let you start with this one, Jake, because I know that you've you've had your ups and downs with Texas this year. Uh, I'm going to go with two. Oh, it's here we go. A two. Two. A two. Here's the reason it's why. Up from the host. I'm, here's the reason why. I, I, I'll have to go and pull the standings because they lost last night. But 24 hours ago, there's a whole – there's like 10 Big 12 teams that are in there that are in a position – to take first. And if Texas, again, they are a sweep away from winning the Big 12. All the struggles, all the BS that they've had to put up with, LeBaron moving out of the Friday night roll, Gasparino struggling early. They are truly a sweep away from winning the Big 12. Like, I know that like the panic button should be a lot higher, but again, they've really struggled against teams not in the Big 12. And when they get in the Big 12, they kind of – like they beat Kansas State. They beat Texas Tech. So it's not as big of a panic button as it should be because the Big 12 is so bad. They are 7-6, and six, and they are currently in sixth place in the Big 12. Uh, overall record, of course, of 20-15. and 15. For me, that's the panic. You're 20-15, 35 games in the season. That is not where anybody expected Texas to be. In sixth place in their own conference, they're behind teams like Cincinnati and West Virginia, teams that they expect to be ahead of. For me, this Texas team, it, it's an eight. They've lost games to teams like Washington. They've lost games at home. They don't seem to have any sort of pulse as to what – they don't have a guy that they turn to and go, you're my you're my guy. We're going to lean on you. We're going to follow you. They don't have that guy. LeBaron Johnson was going to be that guy. He's not. They have to figure out something. So Texas, for me, is an eight, Jake. Uh, Noah, I know you're probably a little higher, but probably not as high as I am, but I'm I'm an eight on Texas. I'm actually going to meet you right at that eight, Mark. Um, good, good. I, I, I don't know how to evaluate this Texas team. It feels like nothing is surprising with this, with this ball club. They have the talent to go out there and make Omaha, but the pieces just have not clicked all year long. I know we talked last week about how this Texas team could easily piece it together if they develop a, a, a leader – both on the mound and at the plate. Uh, LeBaron Jones is not even going on Friday uh, th this week, at least. Um, it's, it's just not right in Texas. And I know that there have been a lot of talks for years about, oh, is this the right staff? What's going on down there? Um, I don't think it's it's soon. I don't think it's soon enough to talk about that kind of situation. But it's just not right in Texas because, like Jake always says in, in April, oh, it's setting up for Texas to host. But right now it's setting up for Texas to miss the NCAA tournament. I know that Jake says, oh, they're in position to win the Big 12 still. That's kind of his little jinx on things. I don't know how to evaluate this Texas team at all. 
So frankly, Mark, I, I just said eight because you said eight. You could have said two and talked me into it. I don't know <laughs> what this Texas team is. <laughs> the evaluation process on this Texas team is hard. But for me, when I look at a 20 and 15 team and you're talking about Texas, you're talking about an issue. And, and they had such high hopes going into this season, and, and it's just been the complete opposite. Now, they can still win the conference. They can still turn things around. But the panic for me is high because of the overall record of 20 and 15. Alabama's next year. So they had a really good non-conference, right? They, they took care of business. They did the things. They only had three losses in non-conference. They were 18 and three. They are now four and nine in conference play, and they're losers of five straight. Noah, this Bama team has been a team that cracked our top 15. They're a team now that has dropped out. I, I mean, they're all over the board, but at four and nine in conference and continuing to lose games now, yes, they're playing Arkansas this weekend. It feels like at some point you can't keep making excuses. Oh, they're playing this team. Oh, they're playing this team. They got to start winning some conference games. Mark, I, I see where you're coming from, but I, I think the important question to ask with these panic buttons is, did LSU have the same expectations that Alabama had? Did, did Florida? So I think that I'm really low on Alabama on the on the panic button scale. I'm going to go like a three. This is Rob Vaughn's first year. Yeah. Uh, did you expect to post a regional in his first year after the team got gutted a little bit? No. Uh, I think they're still in a position to make the NCAA tournament. Obviously not phenomenally great right now, but continue the way you, you kind of generally have been and you'll be in a position to be in a position. This is an Alabama team that I think they're right where they're supposed to be. So I think while they kind of got propped up early on, whether they deserved it or not, I think they did deserve it. But they maybe got their eyes on, oh, maybe we can go to Omaha this year. If we're going to put that label on them, then yeah, you're panicked. But I think they're right where they're supposed to be as a program right now, and I think that's perfectly fine. I, I have them at a five for similar reasons because I think that they didn't have huge expectations early, right? And then they started playing well. Then they were 18 and three. And they're like, oh, we're there. We're, we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're winning games. And now it's starting to kind of, the wheels are starting to come fall apart. The paint's starting to come off that car there. They're five. They're five. They, they have talent. They have the stuff there, but they're not one of the top echelon teams in SEC for me. And they are ahead of teams right now like LSU, Ole Miss, and Auburn but that could quickly fall apart and they could be one of the lower tier teams really fast. Jake, where do you have this I, on the panic? I'm going to go three. I think that, you know, the last week, this week and next week are going to be kind of take your lump series for our, uh, for Alabama. They played Kentucky last week. They play A&M next week. But again, after that, like they kind of get into the SEC West and they can kind of get rolling a little bit. They play Mississippi State, Ole Miss, Auburn, LSU. Those are all four winnable, winnable series. And again, if they can kind of get rolling, take two of three, that's going to be what we expected of, of Alabama. You know, we didn't expect them to go in, beat Arkansas. We don't really expect them. I, I mean, Kentucky, no one really expected that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, they beat South Carolina 2-3. of three. They took 2-3 of three from Tennessee. They are in a position to be a two-seed. And I think that that's going to be a huge, huge overestimation of what Alabama's expectations were going forward. So kind of take your lumps. If they can steal one against Arkansas, if they can steal one against A&M, I think that that'll go really, really long way. But again, if they can take care of business down the stretch, they're going to be set up to be in a position to succeed. They're going to have to beat those teams, though. And I, I'm on yeah. the fence of saying that they're going to be able to go and beat Auburn and Ole Miss and Mississippi State. I'm on the fence. Uh, but I do think that this Alabama team has played above their expectations. So that's why I don't think any of us are really super panicked on this team. A team that has not played above its expectations and it with the talent that they have that we keep all saying – they're 2-11 and 11 now in conference play, and that's Auburn. They have the two wins. They're in dead last in SEC play. I look at this team, and I just can't quite figure them out with all the talent. Ike Irish is one of the best players in the country that nobody can talk about because they're 2-11 and 11 in conference. Jake, my I'm going to say I'll say mine first here. I, I'm high on the panic for Auburn because I feel like they're going to be left out of the tournament now. I'm a 9 because I feel like at this point they're not making the tournament. But where do you have them, Jake? I have them at a 10. And I'll say this: I've seen them against. I've seen Auburn when they played AM. I saw Mississippi State when they played AM. I think Auburn's a better team than Mississippi State. They just keep ending up on the wrong side of some of these games. Where I mean, like they had a chance to win against Thursday against Kentucky. They had a chance to take two of three against Arkansas. They had a chance to take two of three against AM. And they're just starting to kind of compile and add up and add up and add up. And that's what really worries me about this Auburn team is they have played their best baseball already and they're not really looking that good in the win column from it. 
and they're quickly, quickly, quickly running out of time. And again, they have a dangerous, dangerous lineup with Cooper McMurray, Ike Irish. They have a starter that really pounds the zone with Chase Halsups. They are just running out of time quickly. Yeah. And again, it's a wheels have come off nightmare scenario, 2022 Mississippi State situation. When you're saying that they have to go 13 and four down the stretch to get back to 500 in SEC play, that it looks unsurmountable to me. I just don't see it from Auburn, even with all the talent they have. I, I no, will say uh, this. I think oh, that if there's ever going to be a team that kind of breaks that mold and is an outlier on that graph that ESPN likes to show about how many SEC's, it is this year's Auburn. I should say that. If they, it's going to be the outlier, eighteen and fifteen overall, outlier, it shouldn't be in the tournament at this point, especially <laughs> unless they do what we, I just said and they go thirteen and four somehow down the stretch here and really put themselves in that position. But this is, I, I agree that they have Eight the talent. To nine? Would you put them in? At what? Nine SEC wins? No, seven. No, no, a nine and twenty-one. You're going to put them in the tournament? They look that, good. That means they go seven and ten down the stretch, which is not even a winning record down the stretch. So no. No. You don't think if they get to not or ten win? Not, what's the win number that you think Auburn gets a little bit of a pass because they've lost all these close games? They, they have, have to get to thirteen. Yep. They have 13? to get to thirteen. Yeah, I think that they they'd have to go eleven and six down the stretch for me to even consider them. And even then, it'd be a really borderline. Noah, where do you have this team? Yeah, I'm so, I'm gonna go with the nine nine and a half. I don't okay. think you can go all the way ten yet. I know Jake just did, but I think that. This is a team that they have the talent. I think for a 10, you have to have a lot of things going wrong. And obviously, I think things are going right for Auburn. You're just not winning the games, which is obviously all that really matters. But they have the pieces. They they have shown the, the flashes, whereas I think a 10 overall would be, what is wrong with this team? They're not showing any flashes. They're completely dead. So I think there's still hope for this Auburn team. Um, obviously, it's really, really bleak, and they need to start winning right now and probably start sweeping some series. Uh, but – I, I really like this Auburn team. It just doesn't – I'm going to go with the comparison again. I just don't understand how this team is going to miss the NCAA tournament. They remind me of that 2021 Ole Miss team – or 2022 Ole Miss team. Uh, that just – they snuck into the tournament. Probably, you know, you could say shouldn't have been in there. Sure. But watching them, watching them earlier in the year, you thought, oh, right, this is a good team. And they're just not playing like it right now. So it feels like their team is going to figure it out late and sneak in. I hope it happens because – I hope you guys should root for it too if we're in any kind of bracket challenge because I'm going to take Auburn to go far. <laughs> <laughs> they they I, are a dangerous they're, team. They're dangerous. They are. Out. They are. There's no doubt. I, I don't I don't doubt that at all. But when you're looking at two and eleven now and, and now they're sitting there just going, I, I, mean, I they would know. win the Big I, Twelve. I've seen a lot of the upper echelon Big Twelve. They would win the Big Twelve this year. I, I, the, the, I don't even think this SEC here. ranking did has you, the did, actual. Did, did you know that I can mute other people? <laughs> you can <laughs> two two and twelve. By the way, uh, I, I'm actually they, they don't have it fully updated here because uh, Kentucky is now thirteen and one because they don't have the second win yesterday. That's just crazy to me. But let's move on to the next one. Ole Miss losers of eight straight. They're now six eighteen and sixteen overall, but they're three and ten in conference. For me, they're a ten because they're just they don't have any life. I don't see this team. They don't have pitching. They can hit a little bit, but there's no way that this team makes the tournament. And and at this point, it's almost like they got to start looking at their head coach and figure out what they're going to do. Noah, where do you have this old Miss team? To me, this isn't a team that's worthy of the panic button discussion because they, you know, you have to be panicked about something. I think that no matter how the season ends, it's going to end well for Ole Miss in the sense that they'll be able to refresh at the end of the year, no matter what that takes for this program to do that. Uh, and if they make the NCAA tournament, that's a fantastic season for this Ole Miss team. I know that there were some others that had them go into a Super Regional in the preseason, maybe even go to Omaha. Those were extreme predictions and kind of ridiculous. This is an yeah. Ole Miss team that is in a transition era, and it would, it would make sense if the whole program kind of went down that direction. So I think Ole Miss kind of just has to decide whether they want to pull it together and compete right now to make the NCAA tournament and probably not do well in a regional, or do they want to recognize what they are and say, all right, this is a transition era for our program. Yeah. So I'm not I, even going to give just, you a number. I'm not giving you a number. Fair enough. I mean, here's the thing for me though, those, there were people that were, had them in Omaha. And so that's why I put them on this list. Cause it's panic time. If those people could really believe that that was going to be an Omaha caliber team, Jake Ole Miss. Um, 
so I mean, like no, the expectations of this team, I felt like should have been very lowered. But again, this is such a fair weather fan base that you almost need to be competing at all times. And it can quickly, quickly, quickly kind of snowball downhill. They, I never want to root for people to lose their job, but this is going to be a very, very difficult job for whoever kind of walks in behind Bianca here. There's, a, I mean, yeah, they're updating the facilities, but there's a ton of better coaching staffs in the SEC. It's tough to win in the SEC. And I don't think Ole Miss is going to have the commitment that, they, that Bianco had three years ago from them. And I really don't – because they're committing more to Chris Beard at basketball. They're committing to um, the Nepo kid down there at, at the football field where he's stealing a lot of the money. This is going to be a tough, tough job for Ole Miss to walk into. And, again, I wouldn't want to replace a national – a fluke national championship winning coach at the 10th best program in the SEC realistically. It's – I, again, it's panic because the Ole Miss fans think that they should be number one, but yeah. everybody out of that is like, yeah, it's just Ole Miss. Like, yeah. you're not really that good. Yes, I agree. I, I'm fully on board with that. I threw them on the list because I get so much yeah. from the Ole Miss faithful and these team people that thought that they were going to be a regional host and all this. And it's panic time for those folks. They the, the, the seat is on fire. Let's talk about this last team. This is the last one we're going to talk about today. UCLA. Now, a lot of people had this team as a tournament team and possibly competing with Oregon State for that Pac-12 title. They are now, after the loss last night, getting walked off by Washington. They are 5-11 and in conference and 12-19 and overall. I, there is no saving grace for me. If you're a UCLA faithful fan, I, I feel like this is a full reset. This is an eight um, because I don't think that they were national championship bound or even Omaha bound. But for their expectations and to be where they are with the number two recruiting class in the country, to be at 12 and 19, it's it's horrible. Jake, where did you have this UCLA ball club? I had them at eight as well. I think that the thing that worries me about UCLA is that they kind of start to get the USC treatment where they're going to be so bad for so long that no one really will start to care about them. And you almost forget how much talent they had go through there. It's it's really kind of sad that this is how the Pac-12 is going out with some of its flagship schools playing really, really down. I mean, I, I think I saw that UCLA is 1-11 on the road. That's embarrassing as a Big West team, let alone a blue blood of college baseball. It's, it's panic time, but again, it's panic because – you're starting to kind of roll into a relevancy down there in, in LA. Yeah. And for them moving conferences next year and for them to be going this direction in baseball is just mind blowing. Noah, UCLA. I know that we talked about them in the preseason. We talked about them in the PAC 12 show. We said, Hey, this team has a lot of talent. We don't know where they're going to finish. They're showing us where they're going to finish. And it's not great. Uh, this is another one. Very similar to Ole Miss for me. Uh, I know some other people bought the stock. I know, I praised AJ for Kentucky earlier. I'm pretty sure he pra- he was in on UCLA as well, so I have to mention that. Um, but I I, ne- I can't buy into this UCLA team because they keep recruiting really well, and then they just don't produce on the field. So I, yeah. relative to my expectations for them, you're like a three because I that is where I thought UCLA was. But I know that some people had UCLA at Omaha, UCLA yeah. at minimum a top 25 team. So in that sense, you're at a 10 for me because this this program has been in this kind of stuck for a long time right now still recruiting at a high level it's easy to to convince kids to come out to ucla over in california great baseball stadium great facilities great program historically but something's just not right down down in cal in in la over there and it it doesn't make any sense to me and i never that's why i never got on them this year i was on them two years ago and i'm still frustrated about it so for me this is a (laughs) full-blown 10. Fair enough. Yeah, it's just the surprise, I think, is what's caught up to people. And the fact that you look at their overall record now, they're not winning midweeks even. It's not that they're just losing conference games. They're 12-19 and 19 overall now. They're they're just not playing good baseball. They have a losing non-conference schedule as well. I th- Crazy to look at that. Mark, if I could just say, when I said Auburn was a 9.5, this is the difference between 9.5 and, and a 10. And Auburn, <laughs> you look at them and you say, hey, it looks like they're kind of good. UCLA, you say, what in the world? These are some of the best <laughs> high school players in the country. Yeah, and then they can't beat – Washington, who's now finally got his 10th win of the season only. Mark, uh, I do have a question for you. Would absolutely. Heard be the Friday night guy on this UCLA team? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you think? Yeah. Yeah, that? I mean, I think that they would have put him in as a Friday night guy, yes. And, and I think that that's where this program is sitting right now. 
and it's sad to see because they do have some arm talent and they nobody's performing though. So you'd have to throw in probably your biggest name guy, which would be Thatcher Hurd. Yes, he would be the Friday night guy. All right, let's jump into final thoughts here, fellas. I know that I'm excited for the rest of the weekend. I know that I'm going to watch the Pac-12 baseball, even though people give me a hard time about it. I'll watch other baseball as well. Uh, but for me, I'm excited to see Oregon State continue the winning streak at home, hopefully against Stanford today. Oregon playing USC, I feel like, is the best game on the West Coast. But, Jake, what are your final thoughts for the weekend? Uh, I'm going to do a doubleheader today. I get to go over and see Texas and Houston, then drive up and see Vandy, Texas A&M. Um, I hate to kind of dance on your grave, Mark, but it's I truly struggle th- to go see good teams because there's just so many around me. I'm not even going to get to get go see Western Kentucky, Sam Houston. I have to I, catch flights. Like I said, I can mute anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I have to catch flights to go to good games, unfortunately, at the moment. Uh, outside of Oregon State and Oregon, those are the two teams that are closest to me, and they're about a three-hour drive for me. So, yes, Jake, I am jealous of you being able to drive to games so close. I'm happy for you, though, more than anything. Noah, what are you looking forward to the rest of the weekend, buddy? Just how things play out. I, I labeled this one the contenders versus pretenders. I think it's time we see some separation, specifically Florida LSU. How do they win? How do they handle the next two games of the series they're in? I know that we aren't really able to call either of those teams true contenders right now, but talent wise, they should be. I, I want to see how not only how, how it handles this weekend, but how it goes the rest of the rest of the way. But just looking ahead to Saturday and Sunday, what can those two programs do to kind of salvage the weekend? Um, I don't get it with some of these programs. And eventually things have to start making sense. It feels like, Mark, this is a reference for you older cats. Uh, when Lost was on TV every week, people were like, how does this end? Um, that's a really deep cut there, but um, it feels like we're watching Lost right now. <laughs> I think I think that I was freshman year of college. I don't, I'd have to go back and look and see when that was, but yes. Yes, it is a deep cut there for the Lost. Okay, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing more 30-game winners. I know that we're getting there. To, we're finally getting some 30-game winners this weekend. Really excited to see those. I'm hoping that we have three or four of those by the end of the week. But really good baseball. Really happy we're at this point of the season. I think next week we're going to bring out some Omaha 8s for everybody on the show. So pretty pumped about that. I will say let's have a great rest of the weekend, fellas. Jake McKeever, Noah Darling, myself, thanks for joining us on the weekend rotation. We'll see you again.